Well, for those of you who weren't sure that this launch was going to get off the ground today, I want you to take a look at the pictures coming out of Florida, the Kennedy Space Center right now. It looks like it is definitely a go. 15 minutes away from launch, you've got to be thinking what is going through the minds of these astronauts as they sit there prepared to blast off into space. Well, we're going to check in with Miles O'Brien. He's there at Kennedy Space Center. It's got to be so exciting, and at the same time, mm, can you just imagine sitting there waiting to go into outer space, Miles? Uh, well, I can almost predict what they're thinking at this point. They're, they're uh, tumbling through their head as the astronaut's prayer. Dear Lord, dear Lord, please don't let me be the one to screw mm. up. It's essentially what it is. Right, right Jim Riley? Very true. <laughs> Jim Riley's been there a couple of times. He's the astronaut who's going to guide us through this. Let's introduce you to the crew so you know who's aboard there, who's risking their lives today, who's strapped to something with the explosive power of a nuclear bomb, for gosh sakes, and there's going to hopefully everything go smoothly, and in about eight and a half minutes, they'll be going 17,500 miles an hour. Steve Lindsay, the commander, fourth mission, comes from California, U.S. Air Force colonel. He was the pilot for John Glenn's mission, overshadowed a little bit by the senior senator that was on board there, uh, and uh, is a, just a great guy. Yes, indeed. What, in what fact, did you say uh, about him? He was uh, my commander on my last mission, and uh, what I remember about our crew is that we just laughed the whole time, so yeah. it was a great time. All right. You know what? Let's listen for one second to the poll from uh, some of the uh, people right. in the launch control Houston center. Houston flight is go. Myla. Myla go. STM. STM is go. Safety console. Safety console is go. SPE. SP is go. LRD. LRD is go. SRO. SRO is go. You have range clear launch. And CDR. CDR is go. Copy all. And launch director NTD, our launch team, is ready to proceed. Copy that. Thank you, Jeff. Chief Engineer, verify no constraints to launch. Chief Engineering team is go, Mike. Thank you, Charlie. KSC Safety and Mission Assurance. KSC Safety is go. Thank you. Halo, launch manager. Mike, the space station team is go. Thank you a lot, Bill. Range weather. Weather has no constraints to launch. Copy, Kathy. Thank you. And ops manager. Launch director, ops manager, the MMT has no constraints. You are clear to launch. Thank you, sir. Discovery launch director. Discovery, go. Okay, Steve, looks like Discovery's weather is, <laughs> Discovery is ready, the weather is beautiful, America is ready to return the space shuttle to flight, so good luck and Godspeed, Discovery. Thank you very much, Mike, and uh, I can't think of a better place to be here on the 4th of July on the Independence Day to be getting ready to launch into space. To all the folks at Kennedy Space Center and the shuttle program, thanks a lot for working so hard in the uh, last few days and the last year to get us ready. To all the folks on the Florida East Coast, uh, uh, we hope to very soon uh, get you an up-close and personal look at the rocket's red glare. <laughs> very there nice, you have it, Steve. Appreciate those words. Good luck, guys. Steve Lindsay, the commander, uh, offering up some rocket red glare uh, uh, promises, which we should yeah, see fairly shortly, about 12 minutes from now, talking to Mike Leinbach, the man who was standing up, the NASA launch director here at the Kennedy Space Center. The countdown soon will begin uh, counting down from nine minutes. Let's quickly go through the remainder of the crew. Mark Kelly, the pilot, is the only pilot who has a twin in the astronaut office. Scott, uh, tell me about Mark Kelly. He's a United States Navy um, commander veteran of one space flight. Uh, he will be helping uh, do the inside the vehicle work on two spacewalks, West Orange, New Jersey. You remember him because he's Mark and M for mustache, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. That's uh, When those first two guys first showed up, it was very difficult to tell them apart. And uh, fortunately, one of them shaved off his mustache. That's a good thing. Pierce Sellers, who is uh, mission specialist number one, uh, veteran of one space flight. Uh, more degrees than I have socks. Uh, he's uh, born in the United Kingdom likes to sail and is, uh, has degrees in, in, in engineering as well as in uh, ecology. Very interesting, deep, well thought of guy, isn't he? He'll be leading the spacewalks on this mission and uh, he's one of our best. Yeah, Mike Fossum, who is, uh, hails from South Dakota, but really he's all about Texas. He's a Texas Aggie, Texas A&M guy, Lieutenant Colonel in the uh, United States Air Force. He'll be out there doing those spacewalks with Pierce Sellers. Uh, this is his first space flight, 48 years old. Uh, he's got a big family, and uh, he uh, is uh, a guy who's uh, a lot of fun to be with. Exactly. In fact, he is uh, always smiling. He's one of those guys you just love to work with. Lisa Nowak, uh, she's on her first space flight as well. She's a commander of the Na Na United States Navy. She's the uh, um, flight engineer here, mission specialist number two, uh, 42 years old, born in uh, Washington, likes crossword puzzles, but I don't think she's doing any right now. She has three young children. I always think of uh, the mothers especially. 
kissing their kids goodbye for this. That's a big deal. Isn't it? I would expect it is. And she's got twins, so they, uh, so she's got her hands full. I should say. And Stephanie Wilson, the second African American woman to fly, mission specialist, uh, who um, really, she, when we talked to her, she said, you know, I, I wish this weren't such a big deal, and I wish it took so. I'm sorry, it took so long for the second one to come along. Mae Jameson, of course, flying uh, several years ago now, the first to do that. Um, single from Boston and uh, will be helping operate that robotic arm. Exactly. In fact, uh, she's going to have the biggest smile on her face when those solids life of anybody on the crew. I suspect she will. And Thomas Ryder, who is a German, the first European to spend some time on the International Space Station, he won't be coming home with these guys. He'll be staying up for six months on the space station. Uh, born in Germany, he likes to fence. I don't think he'll be doing that over the next six months, probably will he? Probably not. Probably not, <laughs> probably not on idea. station, no. On board the International Space Station. That's your crew, and uh, they are strapped in and ready, and now the heartbeats are picking up a little bit as we get close to the beginning, about uh, 30 seconds or so away before that terminal count phase begins inside of nine minutes. And let, we're 20 seconds away from that right now, and in the meantime, what I'd like to do is show you quickly some of the changes that have occurred on the space shuttle uh, really in the last three and a half years, some of it uh, post-Columbia, some of it post the mission last year, uh, hundreds of changes, uh, modifications to the foam and other safety uh, efforts, and now the countdown clock begins. We're about eight minutes and 50 seconds away. While this countdown clock begins, let's take you through, and first of all, let me just show you, inside the leading edge of the wing, there's a whole series of sensors there to look and detect for impacts, which of course is what brought Columbia down. This part area, the bipod ramp, foam removed there, that was the source of the foam for Columbia. Uh, along here, these so-called PAL ramps, big pieces of foam that fell off a year ago, gone now. They were a big problem, hand sprayed on and taken away. Cameras all throughout. This will be the most heavily photographed space shuttle mission ever, giving uh, engineers all kinds of looks at what is going on. A much longer robot arm uh, capability on this mission. They'll test it out to see if they can make repairs on its own. A fancy bolt catcher so bolts don't become a debris issue during launch. Sort of a little net to catch those bolts, which is part of the modifications. The crew itself. Uh, has the capability of conducting a spacewalk and perhaps doing some rudimentary tests. And if need be, if there is a damaged orbiter, can go out the airlock and stay on the space station, wait for a rescue mission. The space shuttle itself is not your father's space shuttle. 25 years in to uh, its flying, Columbia has prompted a series of changes. Jim Riley, it's still very dangerous, though. It's Coming safer, but it's still very dangerous what we're seeing right now. Certainly, there's a little bit of risk uh, considering the fact that, you know, we're flying pretty much on the ragged edge of physics, going to space and coming home. And, of course, we're all about increasing that margin so that one of these days you and I can buy a ticket and go do it ourselves. But I am but right now, that it's day. still a little risky. Sign me up for that one. That would be good. We want to welcome our international viewers. This is a key moment right here. What you're seeing, if you uh, look out uh, live there onto the launch pad, is the... I, I call it the jetway, but that's not what they call it, of course. It's the shuttleway or whatever you want to call it. It's the white room. White room. It's the ramp, which the crew uses to get onto the space shuttle. It gets Order swung away uh, at this stage of the count, and uh, that's a key and critical point. It gets a little lonely at this point on the launch pad, doesn't it, Jim Riley? Well, at this point, the crew is now on their own, as, as you've just mentioned, and uh, they'll be talking amongst themselves and uh, getting ready for the T minus 31 seconds transition from the launch control center to their onboard sequencer. The next big thing will be the start of the auxiliary power units. Uh, this is what provides um, uh, energy, electricity, uh, runs the hydraulic system of the space shuttle during uh, launch and entry. Uh, it's really, it's, uh, it's powered by some really potent stuff called hydrazine, which keeps it going. And these can be kind of quirky. It's important to watch this and make sure they start properly, right? Exactly. In fact, there's a number of uh, switches that Mark will be verifying right now to make sure they're in the right position so that they're ready to start, which is a call that he just got. And then here in a second, he'll actually throw the switches, opening the fuel tank valves, which will start the pumps, or start the fuel flowing into the pumps that uh, provide the hydraulic power to the orbiter. And then we uh, get, uh, so it's five minutes, we've got that. Then we begin uh, shortly after that what's called the uh, liquid oxygen drain back. And that essentially means that they're, they're no longer replenishing the tanks, correct? Exactly. And explain how that is, because once they uh, put in this super cold liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, it essentially is constantly boiling off, isn't it? They constantly have to replenish it during the long period toward uh, countdown. Exactly. In fact, at the top of the stack, when you see the vents up there, you'll see a little bit of vapor coming off. That's the oxygen. 
And also down by the main engine bells, just before ignition, you'll see a little bit of vapor and a little ice on the main engine bells. That's the hydrogen that's boiling off. So right up until this point, they're constantly replenishing those, those right. reactants. Yeah, take a look at that right now. In the telestrator right here, you'll see what we're talking about. If you look at the base of the launch pad, you might think, geez, they've got the engines going right now. That's just the boil off of the liquid hydrogen, uh, which is uh, escaping out there. And at, this, at a certain point, they stop replenishing the tanks. Uh, still plenty of fuel to get them to where they need to be. Let's listen to Bruce Buckingham for a minute. T minus five minutes of counting. Power units. And we have a go for APU start. The auxiliary power unit activation is being reported complete. All right, as best we know that it's going okay so far. That's, a, that's an important milestone in this countdown. What are they thinking right there on board right now? They're going through checklists. Is the heartbeat quickening a little bit? Uh, probably, especially for the rookies. I know it was when I was uh, on my back for the first flight. Uh, because, I mean, you've, you've gone through a scrubs. Uh, at this point, it starts to get very real, and you're getting to a point you haven't been to before, right? Absolutely, yeah. What is, what is it that is different about this in a simulator? The sound, the feel, what is, I mean, the simulators are wonderful, but there are certain things that cannot be simulated. Well, certainly the, the actual environment of being in the suit and the looking outside and seeing the blue skies of Florida, you, you don't see in the simulators, but the environment's really well mimicked in the simulators as far as what it feels like. Uh, well, on launch day, it felt both times for me like it was just like the, the real thing. Inside four minutes now, three minutes, 55 seconds to launch, and at this juncture we begin the process of gimbling the engines pretty soon. That essentially, the, the nozzles on the engines are movable to, to steer the shuttle in the direction it needs to go, and you'll see this, and you can actually watch it, and that's an important thing to make sure those engines are able to do their job properly. We'll watch them pivot around. I don't know that that's ever failed in, in any launch countdown I've ever seen. That would be critical, and you can feel that inside the orbiter. You can actually feel those go. engines moving inside. And they'd go through the full outer limits. If you're, if you're a pilot, it's like making sure your flight controls are free and correct. Uh, is there a lot of talk amongst the crew at this point, or is this quiet time where you're focused? It depends on the crew. You know, for uh, some of them, they'll be uh, talking. They might be even chatting about something as mundane as uh, Thomas watching the World Cup tonight. You, know, but, <laughs> you but, never know. Got to stay loose somehow. Exactly. Our next big one will be at the top of. Look at the. Put your eye at the top of the external fuel tank. Uh, some people call it a beanie cap. You can call it a gaseous oxygen vent hood if you want. Uh, essentially, that cap is there to, to keep the liquid hydrogen, which is bleeding off, from causing ice to form on that fuel tank. And we know how dangerous any debris can be. That's what that's there for. At two minutes, uh, 55 seconds, any minute now, we should see that lift off. And uh, we should begin uh, the process of counting down. I haven't seen it do, the, do it yet. It seems like they might be a little bit late on that one. Are they? And what they've just done now is they've uh, cleared the caution memory goes. on board, and the beanie cap will be coming off, and uh, they'll be getting ready. Next call will be to get ready to close their visors and get ready to go. That's when it gets uh, real tense. The oxygen begins to flow. The fuel cells are kicked in, which are electrical energy for inside the shuttle as well. And then it gets down to pressurizing the hydrogen tank and no longer replenishing it as well. Um, we're now two inside minutes. two minutes. Two minutes. The weather is go. Technically, it is go. I haven't heard a single thing wrong with this countdown no, yet. Have you? Nope. No, in fact, what they just did was uh, they just got the call from uh, the launch director to close their visors. So they've now closed the visors on their suits and they've started oxygen flow. So at this point, uh, the crew is probably pretty quiet and they're getting ready for a flight. All right, then. What we're going to see after this is at about uh, 50 seconds in, or 50 seconds away, T minus 90 seconds the orbiter now counting. goes to its own internal power. Systems and then good. within about 31 seconds, seconds we will discussion. see it go to the what is the auto uh, sequence, auto ground launch sequencer, which is basically at this point, it's a computerized controlled countdown. We might see a hold there. Uh, if there is a temperature, an incre slight increase in temperature in the liquid hydrogen lines, we're just expecting that possibly. This happens sometimes when the, there's been a couple of tankings, as we saw over the weekend.